Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's technical webinar on Everyone Print 3.7. Um, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out to join us today. It's very much appreciated, as I know a lot of you are very busy. Um, we'll get started now. The session is due to run for approximately 45 minutes, depending on any questions that are asked throughout. So we'll get some formalities out of the way. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? If not, please advise us by the question panel in GoToWebinar. If you have any questions throughout the session, uh, please use the question panel to ask them as you think of them. Uh, we invite any input throughout the session. Um, if there are any questions that we can't answer or don't get around to answering during the session, we will come back to you um, offline. Uh, we will keep a record of everything that's been asked and we will come back to you. And finally, the presentation slides and uh, recording of this webinar will be available after the session has finished. So let me introduce myself. My name is David Ward. I'm a technical solutions specialist with AIT. And I'm joined today by Sean Clark, who's our trainee technical consultant. Good morning. Uh, these sessions are designed to give you an overview of the products that AIT have to offer from a technical perspective, hopefully help you maximise uh, the products that you have and also get more from them. So how today's session will run. Uh, we're covering a number of areas in today's session. Uh, we've decided on this content based on questions we get asked most frequently uh, to do with Everyone Print. It's worth noting, this, noting that as this is a technical webinar, it's assumed that you have prior knowledge of Everyone Print. Uh, otherwise, some of the sections probably won't make a lot of sense to you. Um, so we'll start with the licensing of Everyone Print and we'll then move on to system requirements, security and job handling, external accounting, authentication, mail server configuration, and finally, SSL certificates. Um, at the end of the session, uh, we'll also invite a question and answer session. So now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Sean, who will take us through licensing in Everyone Print. Thanks, David. So, Everyone Print licensing. With the introduction of new features in the recent versions, the license model has been extended recently to include Connect Professional and Enterprise. As you can see from the matrix on screen, each license includes varying functionality and is based on either number of servers or number of devices. There is also an associated cost for each license type. As an example, the internal Office Document Conversion Engine. This particular functionality is only available with the standalone Connect Professional and Enterprise licenses. To ensure you choose the correct license for your requirements, we strongly recommend downloading the full, fully functional Everyone Print trial from the IT website. During the 60-day trial, you will have access to all features equivalent of the Enterprise Edition. During this time, you can establish exactly what features and functions you need, enabling you to choose the conversion of Everyone Print with confidence. So, let's talk system requirements. Operating system. We support all Windows Server operating systems from 2003 SP2 upwards both 32 and 64 bit. With Server 2003 reaching end of life in July this year, we would recommend at least 2008 R2 now, but preferably 2012 R2. As for CPU, this is always a difficult one to qualify in the print related software arena as it all depends on a number of factors such as how many print jobs will be processed and what size print jobs will be sent to spool. As a starting point, we recommend a server CPU such as Intel Xeon 64 or equivalent. Obviously, this varies dependent on demand. Moving on to RAM. Again, this is difficult, difficult to specify an exact figure, but we recommend a minimum 1GB of free RAM, additional to any RAM being used by the server OS and other applications. Thankfully, most virtual server developments it is easy to assign additional RAM if you need it. Finally, we've had, we have hard drive specs. Again, this all depends on usage, but as a starting point, we recommend at least 10 GB of free hard drive space prior to the installation, 20 for higher printing volumes. Let's look at firewall and antivirus exceptions. This table shows the ports used within ERP for communication. As noted, ports that are shown with a star 
are configurable. As for antivirus exclusions, in any environment, we strongly recommend setting an exclusion on the Everun print installation directory and subfolders. This way, the antivirus is not doing any read or write scans whilst the EOP is busy processing documents. It could have a negative effect on performance. So, do you need a dedicated server? Simple answer is no. Everun print is quite happy coexisting on your print server with a print accounting application. Obviously, this is subject to part conflicts, but generally, there shouldn't be any problems. We do, however, recommend a dedicated server in a busy print environment where your existing print server is already consuming a lot of resource. Where you have a dedicated print server, uh, a dedicated server for everyone print, away from your existing print server, everyone print can use an LPR queue to move process jobs over to the print server. As shown on the diagram, the LPR protocol is a standard Windows protocol. However, an LPD service is required on the print server in order to receive the print jobs. For example, in cases where pcanner is used on the print server, pcanner has a built-in LPD server, which can be used to retrieve print jobs from remote servers. Moving on to document support. Everyone Print supports many document types for conversion and printing, as listed in the table. Images, text files and PDFs will be printed without further configuration, but document files will require a means of conversion on the server. Everyone Print does include its own built-in conversion engine. Licenses that allow the use of the built-in conversion engine are standalone, connect, professional and enterprise. The standard connect license would require Microsoft Office and OpenOffice to be inst installed on the EOP server if you wanted to use them. If you are using a Connect license, the required software to be installed on the ERP server to convert Microsoft Office documents is either Microsoft Office 2007 SP2, Microsoft Office 2010, or Microsoft Office 2013. These will allow the conversion and printing of .doc, .docx, .xls, .xlsx, .ppt, and .pptx files. The same license model applies to OpenOffice document printing. OpenOffice 3.3 or 3.4 are required. Let's take a look at the configuration and settings. As mentioned, PDFs, images and texts are supported by default. Here we can see the option for the internal conversion engine. only for professional licenses, not Connect. Both Microsoft Office Docs and OpenOffice Docs require the installation of the software on the server. On our demo system, we use Microsoft Office. Once installed, Everyone Print has a simple document conversion test to confirm functionality. This does take a few moments as it is running through all the file types to convert them internally. Back to David. Thanks, Sean. Uh, in this next section, we'll cover security and print job handling, as the settings directly affect the core functionality in Everyone Print and will be one of the first settings you need to apply after installation. So, there are four possible options uh, for print job security and print job handling. Uh, each of these affects how authentication is carried out and how print jobs are processed through the system, so it's very key to any installation. Firstly, let's have a look at privacy with release. Release codes are used on print job submission. Uh, the user doesn't need to provide a username and password. For example, when this is set, once a user has uploaded a print job to the web portal, uh, they will be issued with a release code on their screen. Uh, this code can then be used to release the document at either an embedded uh, terminal or an external hardware terminal that displays a web page prompting for a release code to be entered. Once that code's entered, their print jobs will come out. Next up, we have um, print, uh, privacy with authentication. Uh, users can choose from multiple print queues and change print job properties. Uh, authentication is required by entering their username and password. 
So when this is configured, um, the user must first log into the web portal with their network credentials. And once logged in, they can submit a print job to a printer of their choice. So um, given an administrator may have set up multiple print queues within everyone print, the user gets the choice of which one to send it to. Um, when they select the printer they want to print to, they can also change some of the job properties, such as whether it's printed in duplex or whether mono uh, is, is used to print the job. Next, uh, let's have a look at direct print. So again, uh, there are two possibilities uh, in terms of the options available with direct print. Uh, first up, we have direct print with authentication. Users must first authenticate before their print jobs are, are output to a single predefined queue. As before, with uh, privacy and authentication, uh, the user must first provide their network credentials to log into the portal. However, with direct print, they cannot choose a print queue. So like before, uh, when they could choose a print queue, when direct print is enabled, they don't get that option. Uh, the job is immediately processed and sent to a single predefined queue that the administrator has set. So this works very well in a pull print environment where there is only one queue being used in the organisation. And lastly, we have direct print with uh, no authentication. So when this is enabled, there is no authentication carried out and also no release codes used either. Um, print jobs are simply processed and output to a predefined print queue. Uh, this option works best in a guest user environment where there is no requirement for secure print release or any job trafficking. The jobs will immediately come out of a single device. So let's go through these options in the Everyone Print Administrator Portal or Admin Portal. So if, uh, once we're logged in as an admin, under the printing and security, uh, here we have the print behavior uh, screen, which is essentially what these settings are. As I mentioned earlier, there are four available settings, uh, privacy with release code, privacy with authentication, direct with no authentication, direct with authentication. Uh, below each of them are a simple explanation on how it behaves with each of the job submission methods. And as you'll notice under direct print as well, there is a drop down with um, a list of given print queues where the jobs, where all jobs will be submitted to if direct print is configured. In this example, we've configured direct with authentication. So users need to authenticate before they can log into the web portal and all jobs are sent to the single pull print queue. So next up, um, we'll have a look at uh, external accounting in Everyone Print. So Everyone Print can be configured to integrate with most popular print accounting solutions. Uh, in this scenario, we're using pCounter. Uh, to make use of the external accounting functionality, you'll need at least an Everyone Print Connect license. Um, as Sean mentioned earlier, there are multiple license options for Everyone Print. Um, so for this functionality, you need at least a Connect license. It also works with um, Connect Professional and Enterprise as well. As we're using um, pCounter, we, we also need a pCounter Pro license actually installed uh, on the Everyone Print server. So the external account options are disabled by default. So should you require them, you need to edit an XML file. Uh, the XML file is located in the Program Files Everyone Print folder. And as you can see on screen, there are two values that need changing in the XML file. These depend on the accounting solution you use, uh, but documentation is available to advise on each specific accounting solution. So I'll now show you the XML file on our demo server. So if we browse in Explorer, Program Files, Everyone Print, in the root of the Everyone Print folder here, there is the eop.xml file. If we just edit that in a simple text editor, like Notepad, for example, um, the easiest way I find to locate the, um, the parameters we need to change is do a find, and the first one being addition. If we find that, immediately the flag we need to enter is W count to enable accounting, and then on addition act, we enter P counter here. Obviously, that will differ depending on the accounting solution. So once you've entered that and saved the file, you then need to restart the Everyone Print web service in the services snap-in. Um, just do that simply by launching services, locating the Everyone Print service, Everyone Print web service just there, and just restart that.
once the um, the Everyone Print web service has been restarted, uh, you can then configure um, Everyone Print to authenticate via the accounting solution. Um, and other useful features such as a simple balance display in the user portal, which is really useful for end users to obviously keep a track of um, their account balance. Okay, um, Sean will now take us through authentication via an accounting solution in a bit more detail. Um, so I'll hand you over to Sean. Thanks, David. So, looking at what David just discussed, ERP can be configured to use P count authentication. This provides the ability for print jobs sent into the Everyone Print queues to be charged back to P count users and logged through the P count software. P count authentication is simple to configure, um, simple to simply selecting a radio box in the configuration. This allows the display of P count balances in the ERP web portal, as mentioned. P count guest users can easily be created too, and we'll move on to that in a second. Also, when emails are sent in by users, their email address is used to look up through P counters authentication to associate jobs to the correct user. Just to confirm, all of the above functionality does require an Everyone Print installation to have a PCAN Pro license on the server. Let's take a quick look at the configuration, please. So, as mentioned, this is simple to enable. Just select that radio box there. There is a test functionality there just to confirm it's working. For guest user creation, there are a couple of options. There's automatic and manual. Automatic will provide a numeric username and password for any user, and it's, this is assigned by Everyone Print. Manual allows guest users to select their own username and password when setting up. So, email settings. Peak, the ERP has the ability to search P counter, do a lookup to its associated user database to authenticate email print users. This will obviously only work if the associated identity manager, such as Active Directory, um, has the email addresses configured. Let's take a look at the DLA. So, this is the pre counter Pro DLA. This is what everyone print uses to pass authentication requests back to pCounter and perform user lookups. In here, there are several options that relate to the pCounter installation. We have the pCounter data server <coughs> that's currently in use. Um, that's the server which the logs are written back to, and here we have credentials to access that. The LDAP information below doesn't apply to any ERP installation. As for advanced settings, a good troubleshooting feature is the record logins. When authentication requests are sent through ERP to pCounter, they will be recorded if this is used. A log file will be created in this file folder. This will only record logins to the user portal, not the admin portal. So, let's take a look at the LDAP authentication. Everyone Print supports authentication via LDAP. This includes Windows Active Directory authentication and other identifier identity managers. More than one LDAP server can be configured in ERP, and I'll show you that in a second. ERP's LDAP settings provide the ability to prepend or append the user with certain information. This is relevant in authenticated print environments where Everyone Print integrates with counting solutions that depend on extra domain information in the print job owner details. As for email lookups, if an email is sent in from an unknown address, Everyone Print will check its LDAP link to see if that email address belongs to a user already. 
let's take a look at the configuration for this. As you can see, we already, we already have a couple of LDAP lookups saved. To enable this, simply check that radio box. To configure your own new LDAP authentication lookup, enter the details in Add a New LDAP Server. Once completed, there is a test functionality at the bottom that can confirm that this is set up correctly. Back to David. Thanks, Sean. Um, so next we'll come on to mail server configuration. Um, mail server configuration is functionality we get asked about fairly often, um, and it's primarily used for the email print functionality. Uh, we can configure everyone print to connect to a mail server using the most popular uh, mail protocols, such as POP3, IMAP, and Exchange. Um, configuration also allows uh, for SSL connectivity, uh, small attachment handling, and uh, domain-based restrictions. So uh, I'll take you through some of those in a bit more detail now. So on the admin portal, we go into email print. So from the top, we have our um, uh, email address that everyone print will use uh, in order to send emails out to users. Here's the drop down uh, for the incoming server type. So we can choose POP3. There's also options for SSL there, uh, IMAP and as I mentioned, the Exchange Mappy Connector or Exchange Web Services. As um, we use a hosted Exchange platform, um, we've configured ours to use the Exchange Web Services protocol, uh, which is encrypted as well by default over HTTPS. And of course, there are login information for the mailbox here. Just below that, um, there is an option to uh, customise the poll time for the mailbox. Um, by default, it's 10 seconds, but that can be customised. Obviously, lower the number, the quicker the mail is, is, uh, is uh, obtained by everyone print. So, um, wouldn't recommend setting it too low, though, otherwise it will just probably get stuck in an endless loop. So, 10 seconds is probably a, a good amount of time. It's also worth mentioning at this point as well that everyone print will need a dedicated mailbox um, in order uh, for print jobs to be submitted by email. Um, this is because everyone print actually downloads the email messages that are sent to the mailbox for processing. So obviously if you've got other users trying to use this same mailbox, they'll find there is often conflicts and mail disappearing all over the place because everyone print is, is downloading it. Um, that's primarily so the mailbox doesn't fill up over time. So further down the page, um, we've got, as I mentioned earlier, uh, options for small attachment filtering. So, for example, where people have small images in the footer or the signature line of their email, we can configure um, sort of a ceiling limit or, a, or a, a, an upper limit for small attachments, whereby any attachments of that size or lower will be filtered out by everyone print. So um, that just prevents everyone print from creating a print job out of a very small image and obviously wasting a lot of resource. We've also got an option here uh, to create a print job out of the email message body. Um, simply that does exactly what it says. Um, with it enabled, it will process attachments, but it will also create a print job out of the message body uh, email message. So in this scenario here, we've got that disabled because we only want attachments to be processed. And then lastly, we have the email print permissions at the bottom. So we can choose um, where mail is only accepted from. In this, in this example, we've got our own domain here. So everyone print will only accept email from AIT.co.uk. Alternatively, uh, we can also choose, if we get rid of that, we can choose email or domains where mail is rejected. So um, if there are particular domains that you don't want to allow mail from, you can just enter those in, in that line there and everyone print will simply ignore those messages. And finally, probably worth mentioning, um, just for troubleshooting sake, uh, there is a useful test incoming mail settings function here. Um, if you tick that and hit save, that will also test connectivity to the mail server. And of course, in an ideal world, you should get your uh, test completed successfully message. If you don't, uh, error messages that return tend to be fairly useful and will sort of point you in the right direction um, 
But there is more troubleshooting um, error message uh, information in the everyone print guide. So that brings us to the end of um, the email print settings or email settings for the server configuration. Next, uh, we'll move on to our last section, which is um, SSL certificates and certification within everyone print. Again, this is something we get asked about um, quite frequently, but as it's handled externally to everyone print, it's difficult for us to provide support, especially as it relates to an organization's security. Um, so for this webinar, I've created a video clip which takes us through all of the required steps for creating an SSL certificate to use in Everyone Print. In the video, we use Keystore Explorer uh, as recommended in the Everyone Print documentation. So first off, uh, generate the certificate signing request. As I mentioned, we're using Keystore Explorer. So first of all, we need to create a new Keystore. Following the instructions in the Everyone Print Guide, we first of all create a new key pair. Just goes through and generates that. Uh, first of all, select version 3, then the algorithm of MD5 with RSA and a validity period of 10 years. Uh, next up, we need to enter some naming information. Uh, so a common name, which is our uh, URL to our EOP site as well as some information on the organisation. Um, this will be used within the certificate and sent off to the certificate authority. We also need to provide an email address where the certificate will be linked back to. If we just OK both of those. And create an alias that's simply for reference purposes. Um, now, at this point here, we also need to create a password for the key pair. Um, once we enter that, we get the successful message. So, next up, we need to generate our CSR file or certificate signing request. Again, MD5 with RSA for the algorithm and put in the company name if you wish. And next up, we need to save this. Now, a very important point um, is we need to save the Keystore file. Um, this allows us to come back to it at a later date to import the reply back from the certificate authority. So um, save the file and specify a password if it prompts you to do so. And here we have our generated CSR file that we use. So next up, we need to request the certificate from the CA. In this instance, we used uh, freeSSL.com for a 30-day certificate, just as an example. Obviously, this will very much depend on your chosen um, certificate authority. So this is just really for information. Um, I had to go through the sign-up process. And then we copy in the contents of the CSR file that we created earlier. And next up, there were multiple uh, validation steps involved with uh, creating this certificate. Um, the first of all was one uh, email validation, which was sent to a specific email address. And the next one was uh, telephone authentication as well. So we, here we are just completing the email verification. And followed by uh, telephone authentication, which was successful. Last step is to approve um, the order. And then that's um, the certificates that are sent back to us from the CA. So we now need to import these. Now, one of the things I picked up is that intermediate certificates seem to be used. They're certainly referenced in the manual. Um, so our provider provided us with two intermediate certificates. 
these must be applied in the right order, so primary and secondary. Um, this is to create a chain of certificates from uh, the, the Everyone Print certificate we created right up to the certificate authority. So we need to apply these in order. Simply double click the icon, install certificate, working through the wizard. Um, automatically ass assigning them to a container is also fine. So once the intermediate certificate is applied, we need to do exactly the same with the actual Everyone Print certificate. Again, just working through the wizard and automatically selecting a container. Now what we need to do as well, just to confirm that these certificates have been imported and chained correctly, is if we open our EOP certificate, you can see the hierarchy. So the intermediate certificates and then the Everyone Print certificate at the bottom. That basically means that the chain is intact. So next thing we need to do is export the Everyone Print certificate out to a P7B file, including certification paths, and just choose a file name for this particular file. So once we've done that, and exported it successfully. The next step is actually importing that as a reply to our key store file. So as I mentioned, open up your saved key store file from earlier, entering the password you specified when you, when you saved it. Then right click on the key pair and import CA reply. Entering the password for the key pair that was specified earlier. Next up, we need to choose our P7B file. So if we locate that uh, where we saved it. And then we just get some confirmations of the content of the reply and just a confirmation that we actually want to do it. Hopefully you'll get an import successful message. At this point, we then need to save the file again. So now we've imported the uh, certificate response, we need to save the key store file as we actually use this file next. So once we've done that, we need to copy the saved key store file into uh, the Everyone Print Program Files folder. So in Explorer, just go into Program Files, Everyone Print, ETC, and just paste in the Everyone Print uh, key store file we created and give it a suitable name as well. Next we need to edit the jetty.ssl or jetty SSL XML file. Uh, just edit that in Notepad. Uh, first of all, if you've not done it earlier, we need to change the port. Uh, in this instance, we're using the default SSL port or HTTPS port, which is 443. We then need to edit the path uh, to the key store file. And we do that twice. And then lastly, we also need to specify the passwords for the key store file and the key pair. So if we just enter these passwords in this SSL file. And just repeat the process. So once um, the, you've finished editing the file, that just needs to be saved. And then as a last step, uh, the Everyone Print web uh, service needs to be restarted. Uh, that just applies the configuration. So just from the services snap in, locate the Everyone Print web service and just hit restart. Now that should be your certificate applied. Now obviously to demonstrate that, if we browse to our web portal again, if I just open that up and go to eop.ait.co.uk, we can immediately see that SSL is enabled by the key, uh, the, the uh, padlock on the address bar. You can see uh, identity has been verified and that also SSL is being used and the, encrypt uh, the connection is encrypted. So that is a successful SSL certificate installation.
So, um, thank you for bearing with the video. It was quite long, um, but the clip has been shortened somewhat from the full process. However, it does contain all of the required steps. So hopefully that will help anybody out there who's wanting to apply an SSL certificate. Um, to emphasise the steps required and for the benefit of people using the presentation after this webinar, I've summarised the steps as follows. So, uh, generating a new certificate request, uh, creating a new key store file and creating a key pair, generating the certificate signing request or CSR file, saving the key store, which is very important, and then finally requesting the certificate using the information from the CSR to your chosen uh, certificate authority. Moving on from that, we've then got the follow-up steps. So once you've uh, received the CER files from your certificate authority, installing the intermediate certificates, installing the Everyone Print certificate, ensuring the certificates are chained correctly, ensuring the hierarchy is set. Export the EOP certificate as a P7B file, including the paths. Open the saved key store and import the reply from the P7B file. Then save the key store file again with a password uh, if prompted. Finally, copy the key store file to the Everyone Print Program Files folder to the ETC folder. And then as a last step, edit the Jetty SSL.xml file to reference the new key store file along with the passwords. So that brings us to the end of the technical content of the webinar. Thank you very much for bearing with it. And finally, we'll move on to a question and answer session. So, so we'll go through some questions and answers now uh, relating to the web session we've just done. Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks for spending the time watching today's presentation. We really do appreciate it. If you do need any more information, there's uh, documentation available on our website at ait.co.uk. Um, we have a lot of help and support guides there as well. In addition to that, we have our LinkedIn uh, P County UK group, uh, which gets updated regularly with technical tips from our technical services team. Obviously, if you do require any support or assistance with Everyone Print, you can email us support at ait.co.uk or call us at the office to log a support case. Thanks again for watching today's session.